In Matthew chapter 24, we're going to just pick up there. Jesus left the temple, and he was walking away with his disciples. And when they came to him, and he called their attention to its temple. He says, do you see all these things? <clears throat> he asked. I tell you the truth, not one of the stone here will be left on another. <clears throat> Everyone will be thrown down. And as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, so he leaves Jerusalem, he goes down through the valley, comes up on the Mount of Olives, they're overlooking the city of Jerusalem, and he says, do you see all these things? He said, I tell you, not one stone of the temple will be there until they are all destroyed, wiped out. <clears throat> and as he was on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. He said, tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? There's two questions here that are asked. And the first one is, what is the sign of your coming? Uh, I mean, <clears throat> when will all these things happen to the city of Jerusalem? That answer is not given here. You have to go to the Gospel of Luke to find that answer. But in this passage, he does answer the second one. I tell you the truth, that not one stone will be here will be left on another until every one will be thrown down. So what we have here in this passage, Jesus is about to tell them things that the Old Testament has talked about book after book after book. It's called the Day of the Lord. Now the Day of the Lord, okay, is not the same as the Lord's Day. You'll notice at the end of every service I say to everybody, okay, have a wonderful Lord's Day. That idea of the Lord's Day comes from the book of Revelation where John the Apostle uh, was on the Isle of Patmos on the Lord's Day. And uh, so while he was on the Isle uh, on the Lord's Day, was saying that he was there on a Sunday. But in this passage, it's talking not about a Sunday, but about the Day of the Lord. And if you were to go through the Old Testament, you would read in the Old Testament probably a, a thousand references to the day of the Lord. And I had a whole bunch of them on the screen. I'm not going to be trying to flip through my Bible to all these, but you can find them all through the book of Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Jeremiah. You'll find them in the book of Amos. You'll find it in the book of Joel. You'll find it in the book of Zephaniah. You'll find it in the book of Zechariah. These terms are everywhere. We've talked about the fact that the Bible is 50% prophecy, and 25% of that has already been. <clears throat> Jesus says in this passage that dark days are ahead. Down in the, further in this passage, in chapter 24, in verse 21, Jesus says this, For then there will be great tribulation, great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will be like that again. There's a time period coming that will never, this period, nothing else has been like it. It's the day of the Lord. It's a time period. That in a time of darkness. So I got over here, on this side of the slide, I got darkness. Okay, and it's also a time of, on this side, it's a time of light, okay? Got darkness and light. Jesus calls the period of that time of darkness of the day of the Lord of the Old Testament, he calls that tribulation in this passage. Over here, he calls it the kingdom of light. I wanted to bring these passages out of the Old Testament where they talk about the day of the Lord. First of all, I want you to notice in this passage that the day of the Lord, this period of darkness, is very dark. In Joel chapter 2, he describes it. He says, blow the trumpet, sound the alarm. Let all who live in the land tremble for the day of the Lord, this period of time of darkness and light, tribulation and coming kingdom. He said, it begins with darkness and gloom, a day of cloud and blackness. On the next slide, it says here, in the next chapter, or just a little bit further down in that chapter. The day of the Lord is great. It is dreadful. I think that's where Jesus came up with this, and he called it the great tribulation. He says, who can endure it? Further in the passage, chapter 3, it says, multitudes, multitudes are in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. This valley of decision is a future judgment period. So you got this terrible, dark day that's ahead, and it's going to be followed by a wonderful, bright kingdom of God. And in between is this valley of decision where there's going to be a judgment of all the nations on the earth. He says the sun and, will, and the moon will be darkened. There's no stars longer 
shining in the sky. There we go, the day of the second coming. You see what we have is from Joel talking about the day of darkness and gloom, day of decision. Zechariah tells us about the Lord's return. Now this is not his return in the air to take the church out of the world, but this is his return to the earth and uh, he is going to actually in this passage tell us in chapter 14 that when he comes, that there is going to, the Lord himself will go out and fight. He returns actually to the earth, and he goes out and he fights against all the nations as they fight in a day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Anyone remember that when Jesus ascended into heaven, he ascended from the Mount of Olives? When he comes back to the earth to actually set up his kingdom upon the earth, he is going to stand on the Mount of Olives. At that moment, there is going to be on the east of Jerusalem, on the Mount of Olives, there's going to be a split in the terrain, and the, 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 it's going to just split from the east to the west from, and form a great valley there in between the two. Now, in this next, next passage here, he says in the same chapter of Zechariah, Joel says there's a time of darkness, gloom, battle, war, Christ returns, battles, cleans up that mess, then he enters into a period of kingdom. In this passage, for the Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day, there will be one Lord, and his name is the only name. The question then becomes, how does the church fit into all of this? Time of darkness, Lord's return, battle, setting up a kingdom. Where does the, the church fit in? How does the rapture, where does it take place? We've been talking about that for the last few weeks that Jesus said that he is going to come back, okay? I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I come back that I might be able to take you where I am. Well, it's going to happen before the day of the Lord. For we find in this past, for you know that very well, he says to the Thessalonians, right after he talked about the rapture, he says, you know very well that the day of the Lord, this day of darkness, this gloom, okay? And the time after that of light, he said, this day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. It's going to come so fast, so unexpected. While people are saying peace and safety, that expression is because there's going to be a rise, an end time character who's going to promise to the world peace. And while he's promising to the world peace, especially to the nation Israel, all of a sudden the passage says here, while they are saying peace and safety, then comes sudden destruction. Further down in the passage, the Apostle Paul is saying, for God did not appoint us, though, to this darkness, to this wrath. He did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died so that, whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Now, all of this is introduction. All of this is introduction to what I want to say. You see, think about this. Jesus said, since the rapture removes the church from the earth before the day of the Lord, because he said, I will come back to take you where I am. But in the coming that he's talking about in the Old Testament, he comes back and he stays on the earth and he rules for a thousand years. And so this coming back is going to take place before all of this, before the dark and terrible day of the Lord. The Lord takes the church out of the world. They're, at, they're being rewarded. And so while this is going on, the question asks, what happens to those who are left behind on the earth? What happens to them? Well, on our next slide here, we see they are dark, dark days ahead. But the question is, how dark? How dark? How dark are those days? That's where we pick up with Matthew 24, which I just read, where Jesus came to the temple. He leaves the temple. He goes up on the Mount of Olives. And he goes, as he crosses in onto the, the Mount of Olives, he says, you see all these things? And he said, they're all going to be thrown down. It's that at that point that Jesus was sitting and the disciples asked him and they said to him, when will all this happen? What will, what will it be like? And then when he says, when will these things happen? It tells us in the, in, and what, when, <clears throat> when will all of this, the income, what will be the sign of it? We come back to this. He said, the answer is found to the first one in Luke, which I mentioned already. And into the second one, he answers in verses 4 through 44. Now these verses, this answer that he gives about when is all this going to happen in the sign of his coming and the end of the age falls into three parts. 
And those three parts are, he talks about the beginning of a tribulation period. For Jesus said, there is a time that is coming such as never has been on the planet Earth. He talks about the beginning of that. He talks about the middle of that. And he talks about the end of that. All in Matthew chapter 24. Let's move to just the beginning of the tribulation period. In verse 4, it says this. Deceptions and false Christ are going to arise. Deception. Deception. Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Most people call this uh, uh, stage uh, the Antichrist. Well, the word Antichrist does not occur here. Antichrist is a term that John uses in the Bible. No one other than John. And several times in the Bible, John, John mentions what Antichrist is. In fact, as we look at this next verse, it says, Antichrists are many because in 1 John 2.18, John writes to the, his audience, he says, Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard, that the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. He's saying, listen, we are living in the last hour, which is characterized by many people claiming to be Christ. We've seen them even in our day, the Jim Joneses of the world, where they say, hey, I am the Messiah. The Antichrist is going to say this, that Jesus is a lot, that, that that he's a liar. He's going to tell you that Jesus is not who he is. Who is a liar? It is the man who denies Jesus is the Christ. The Antichrist is going to say, it's, Jesus is not the Messiah. I am the Messiah. Such a man is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. But no one who denies the Son has the Father, and whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. He's saying, listen, this this individual who denies that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, is Antichrist. Next slide. We'll look at all these verses. In the next slide, we find that in John chapter 2, there we go, in John, John chapter 4, 1 John 4, 1, it says, but every spirit that does not acknowledge him, but they reject him, this is the spirit of Antichrist. So there's not only a person, there's a spirit, an attitude of Antichrist. Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ in coming in the flesh, they reject Christmas. Now we're about to come into the season of Advent. But they reject that God has come in the flesh because the Antichrist says, there is no God, there is no Christ, I am your God. They have gone into the world and any such person is a deceiver and the Antichrist. That's all of those mentions of Antichrist. That's everyone in the Bible. It tells us that the Antichrist, the false Christ, the person is going to rise. In the end time, there's going to be a lot of these individuals claiming to actually be the Christ. The next one is that there will be wars. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen but the end is still to come. Nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against nation. Think about it. Think about it. There have been wars ever since man's been around, hasn't there? So you might say, well, what kind of sign is this? Well, the wars that he's talking about, I don't believe are the wars that we are we, we, we're thinking of. The wars, if we'll look at the next slide, go all the way back to prophecies in the Old Testament that there was wars coming. In fact, in Ezekiel 38, there is a battle that's coming. It's called the Battle of Gog and Magog. People are, are, are kind of not sure where it, uh, this will begin. If it starts at the beginning of the, the tribulation period, if it's at the middle, if it's at the end, or some other time, I'm quite confident that it is in the middle. That's why he said there's rumors of war. When you hear rumors of things aligning like this, you will know that the Lord's return is going to happen soon. He says, Son of man, set your face against Gog. I put a, a, a globe of the earth, and I got little nation Israel down there in the little center there. You see that little tiny nation, that little sliver? Gog is uh, the name of, uh, of a, a leader of the future. I'm not sure if his name will really be Gog, but Gog represents his name. He comes from the land of Magog. That's what the word Ma on Gog means, place of Gog. That's where he comes from, Gog of Magog. And it says here, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Now, 
A lot of modern commentators try to find where are these places on the map, okay? And some try to identify this word where it says chief. The word chief is rosh in Hebrew. The word rosh means head, chief, leading, foremost. But some take it as a name that the name then is transferred over into modern English as Russia. Now, I don't know if I can do all that, but I do know that it is in this area. The, the Gog, Rosh, or Russia, prince of Meshach. Meshach, some want to say, is Moscow. And others want to say, and Tubal, which is a city of Tubalsk. And what they're saying is, there's this region in the north. He says, prophesy against him. Saying, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. He says, Persia, I... Cush and Gomer. These are all, all these nations have come together and they made a coalition together to fight against the nation Israel. He says, Persia, Cush, put, will be with them. Who? Gog and Magog, the northern invading army, with all their helmets and their shields, and also Gomer will be with his troops. And Beth Togarma, let's go to the next one. This one's interesting because we know that Togarma is Turkey today. There is a coalition led by this northern invader, and as we look at the world today, we see Turkey's back in the news again. Anybody notice that? Turkey's back in the news? Turkey is that NATO ally, so he is allied with the West, not with Russia. But what is going on? There's been a fracturing of all kinds of nations aligning themselves. None of these things have to take place until the church is gone in the rapture. This is the thing that's going to be happening on earth. There's going to be a time of peace and safety. Everybody's saying, oh, it's peaceful and safety. But all of a sudden, this coalition that's developed is going to some point in this period of the day of the Lord, the terrible tribulation that Jesus called the great tribulation, they're going to align themselves, and it says from a far north, and I think I got one more slide there, it says, and many nations with them. I don't even think he's put all the nations that are there, but he's taking the primary characters of the end time battle that's going to take place. He says, you're going to first hear rumors that something is brewing. Something is brewing. After many days, you will be called to arms. Who? Gog. In the future years, this has been predicted. It's been in our Bible sitting there for centuries. You will invade a land that has recovered from war. Now that land is the Holy Land, whose people were gathered from many nations. Oh, the nation Israel was scattered, and they were not a nation for years until World War II ended. At the end of World War II, then they were incorporated as a nation again. They were brought back from every nation on the planet. Watch what it says. He's going to invade a land that has recovered from war, whose people were gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel. They're there again as a nation, which had long been desolate ever since Titus in 70 AD destroyed the city of Jerusalem. They have been desolate, but they will be returned to the land. That's happened already in our, lives, our, our lifetime. This northern invader, they had been brought out from the nations, and now all of them will live in safety. You, Gog, with all your troops, and many nations with you, you're going to advance like a storm. You are going to be like a cloud covering them. They're going to come from the north. In fact, Daniel chapter 11 talks about the northern invader. They come from the north. All these coalition armies are together, and they come from the north down upon the land. You will come from a place in the far north, from many nations uh, with you. You will advance against the people of Israel like a cloud that covers the land in the days to come. Oh God, I will bring you against my land. He says, this is what will happen. There it is. In that day. A reference to the day of the Lord. The day of, Lord. The day of darkness, of war, of clouds, of gloom, of gloom, doom. He says, in the day of the Lord. In that day, in my zeal, in my fiery wrath, I have declared that at that time there shall be a great earthquake. Now, I had intended to make that whole planet Earth there shake a little bit at this point. There's going to be an earthquake in the land, and I will summon a sword, the sword of Gog, on my mountains. So as he summons this sword of, of Gog onto the mountains, they come down upon the land. Every man's sword will be against his brother. Do you remember the book of Judges when we went through that a year ago? Gideon took 300 men. They surrounded the 35,000 Midianites. 
they blew the trumpet, they cracked open their jars and the flames, and, and they were all surrounded by 300 men and the 35,000 of them in the middle of the night pulled out their swords and they went out and they started fighting each other. When all this coalition of armies comes down upon Israel, it says here that every man's sword will be against his brother. I will execute judgment upon him with plagues. God's going to send down plagues upon them like the land of Egypt. And with bloodshed, they're going to be fighting each other. I will pour down torrents of rain and hailstone like Sodom and Gomorrah. And with burning sulfur on the troops and on many nations with them. Everybody that's come against Israel uh, in this battle that takes place in the day of the Lord, he says, on the mountains of Israel, you will fall, you and all your troops with you, and the nations, all the nations with you. You are going to fall. This is going to be the end of that northern invader. Miraculously, here they've come up and they've attacked Israel. And just like in the days of Hezekiah the king, when 135,000 of Sennacherib's armies were around Jerusalem and, and Hezekiah went into the, in, into the sanctuary, laid the threatening letter from Sennacherib the king uh, and his armies, he laid it down before the Lord and he prayed over it. And Isaiah the prophet came in and said, listen, not one arrow is going to fly over the wall. By tomorrow, they'll all be dead. I like the way King James put it. They're going to wake up and find themselves dead. <laughs> you know, a few mornings I get up and I feel a little pr pretty crummy, but I've not yet woke up and found myself dead. God is going to do something miraculous on the mountains of Israel here on planet Earth, when, when these nations invade, God is going to destroy the armies by using them, plus using miraculous means, and they're all going to die on the mountains of Israel. And he says, it is coming. It will surely take place, declares the Sovereign Lord. This is the day I have spoken of. At the part where he says here at the beginning of Matthew 24, he says, this is just the rumors, not of just any war. Rumors of this war. Honestly, folks, if you, read, if you read prophecy, there's so much there. I believe this is just the beginning battle of a three-and-a-half-year war that includes not just the armies of the north, but there are going to be armies from the south that will then invade, armies from the west that will then invade. There's going to be armies from the east that will then invade. And it's going to culminate when the Lord returns and he returns, as we saw in Zechariah, and he fights as a warrior for his people, and he conquers everyone. There's the valley of decision where they are judged, and then there's a setting up a kingdom for a thousand years. That's all right here in the Bible. Wars and rumors of war. The next thing that he says is there's going to be famines and earthquakes. Famine, that usually follows war, doesn't it? But earthquakes, we saw in that passage that there's going to be earthquakes associated with the famine. He then says in verse 8, all these are just the beginning of birth pangs. He's relating this to like um, a woman who is pregnant and she first has her first contraction says, oh, I think it's time. <laughs> my mom, when she had my oldest brother, was so, so naive. She thought that, she thought that uh, when she had her first birth, birth pangs, she went to the doctor. She, I mean, she's in the hospital. They had the ward back then. And so there's a lady in the, in the bed next to her. Well, she's been in labor for like 20 hours. And it's like she's really screaming and it's, it's hurting like crazy. And my mom prays, thank you, Lord, that I don't have pain like the lady next to me. <laughs> Come on, any of you who've been through that process, you know that it's nothing at the beginning like it's going to be at the end. He says, this is just the beginning. There's peace and safety. Everything's wonderful. Everything's going to be fine. Um, you know, millions of Christians are gone, but everything's fine. Then all of a sudden, when they say peace and safety, sudden destruction, all of this war breaks out. So when you hear these words of war, the next one is then that there will be martyrdom. Then you will be handed over and persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated of all nations because of me. We've already seen how the, there's so much anti-Semiticism in the world in the past through Hitler. It's going to happen again on a much grander scale. Have you read the papers, watched the news at all? There's a, a rise in anti-Semiticism already today. Already today. Because it tells us how fierce this is going to be. 
And the fifth seal of the book of the Revelation, it said, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. If you do not take the mark of the beast, the Antichrist, if you do not take his mark and you don't have it in your hand or your forehead, you can't buy yourself, they're going to round you up, they're going to kill you, they're going to martyr you, and be, you will be beheaded for Christ. Slide. You see, in the next chapter he says, John says, there before me were great multitude that no one could count for every nation of the people and language. They were standing before the throne of God to the front of the Lamb and they were wearing robes. And he said they were holding branches in their hand. And then the next slide goes on and says this. A few verses down, verse 13. Then one of the elders asked John, the, the apostle, these in white robes, who are they? Where do they come from? <laughs> John answered, sir, I, I don't know. You know, he said to them. And then this is the answer that the angel gives him. These are those who have come out of the great tribulation. This is going to be a time. They have washed their, their robes and they've made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They have died during the tribulation. There's going to be all these people who are going to be massacred. A time, a time of great trouble such as has never been. Jesus said, great tribulation, nothing ever before like it, nor ever will be after it. At that time, there's going to be a great apostasy, a turning away from the faith. At that time, many, notice the word many, many will turn away from the faith. And they will betray and hate each other. It's not going to be a love fest. And many false prophets will appear, and they're going to deceive many people that you do not need the Lord Jesus Christ. You do not need your faith. It reminds me of what's going on right now. 1 Timothy talking about our age. The Spirit clearly says that in the latter times of the church age. Some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits, things taught by demons. We are living in the age of idolatry, probably the worst form of idolatry. We are living in the age of self-idolatry. You know, you go back mm, 15, 20 years, before the rise of the, you know, the cell phone having your camera on it. Whenever people took pictures of things, they took pictures of things. If you went to the Statue of Liberty, you took a picture of the Statue of Liberty. You went to the Grand Canyon, you took a picture of the Grand Canyon. But what do we do today? I'm perfectly in focus. I'm perfectly in focus. It's all a blur back there, but there I was at the Statue of Liberty. There I was at the Grand Canyon, right? Isn't that what we do? The idolatry of our age is me. I worship me. They reject the nuns. You know who the nuns are? They're the ones when it says uh, religious affiliation, they check none of the above. The nuns. There are more people today that check off none than there are who are evangelical Christians. Actually, it's the exact same amount as there are Roman Catholics in America. Is that amazing? There is a departure and a falling away, and what's happening now is nothing compared to what is going to happen after Christ takes the, the church out of this world and people are left to this great, terrible day of the Lord. There's going to be a cold-heartedness. Cold-heartedness. Because of the increase of wickedness, people are going to... There's no Christian influence left. Well, they're gone. There's going to be an increase in wickedness, and the love of most will grow cold. But the person who actually adheres... In, and trust in the Lord and makes it to the very end will be saved to go into the kingdom of God. Whew. The love of most will grow cold. That's not just true of then. It's going to be really cold then, but it's true now. It says, listen, but mark this. There will be times in the last days. He's speaking here of the church age, I believe, because he's writing to the church at this point. People will be lovers of themselves. Oh, wow, isn't that true? Lovers of money without love. Lovers of the, without lovers, not lovers of the good, he says. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. It's there they are, taking their picture. I just love myself. 
They worship and they love themselves, and that's the age in which we live. It's a heartless age, but you think it's heartless now? Wait till the, after the church is gone. In spite of all of that, there's going to be a great awakening. And this gospel of the kingdom that Jesus was preaching will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. The end here does not mean that this is the end at this point, but the end is now in sight. Then it will still come. It's coming. That's not the end. This is not the end. It's still coming. Go to the next. He said, there's going to be this first part that's called the beginning of pain, the beginning of the, of the labor pain, of the tribulation. Next part. After that is the great tribulation. We're going to pick up with that next time. But I just want to make this one point. The church is gone. This is what happens to those who are left behind when the Lord comes. How do I know that? Next part here. Because Paul has said, for God did not appoint us to suffer wrath. This is a period of wrath. It's doom. It's gloom. It's darkness. He did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through Jesus Christ. When I accepted Jesus Christ, that made me one of his. Whenever that, before that age ever begins, he's taking out of the world everyone who has received Jesus Christ because we have not been appointed to a time of wrath. See, next time we're going to pick up with what's in the middle of the tribulation. But I want you to take this with you today. Even though it's been a little discombobulated, all this, let me just try to tie it together, okay? Here we go. God did not appoint us to suffer wrath. In the book of Revelation, the sixth chapter, which uh, talks about the same period of time, it ends in the very last verse where it's saying that they're trying to hide themselves from the wrath of the Lamb. Jesus was the Lamb of God that came to take away sin in the first coming. He is uh, going to come the second time with judgment upon the world. He says, but we've not been appointed to the time of wrath, but rather to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, we, we've been throwing the lifesaver, and I grab hold of that, and I'm saved. I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. He died for us. Listen. Jesus took all my wrath, all this that they're going to experience. He, he's taken it all on the cross. That if I would accept him as my Savior, I will be saved from the wrath that is to come. I will go to be with him. Where? To the judgment seat of Christ that we looked at last week. Where will we receive a reward? He says, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Theologians call this pre-tribulation rapture. Pre, before, tribulation, we take off to be with Christ if we know Jesus as our Savior. You see, he died for us that whether we are awake, I'm alive, or I sleep, I've died. That's a euphemism for living and dying that we may live together with him goes all the way back to Jesus telling Martha and Mary, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he die. And whosoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? You see, if you know Jesus, you never die. When, they, when your body separates, your spirit from your body, you go to be with the Lord. You'll be reunited at the rapture. You won't go through all this wrath. You'll be in heaven receiving your reward. At the end of that, when the Lord returns, you return with him, and then you go into the kingdom, the day of light. Because we are children of light, not children of darkness. He's taken all of our wrath. We have a wonderful future. Let's pray. As we go to prayer, the real question is, if Jesus were to return in the air today to take his church out, would I go with him or would I be left behind?
you don't have to be left behind. You can know him as Savior today by believing in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we see dark days are in store. Both the Old Testament and New Testament, Jesus himself said, a great tribulation, a time as such as never has been or ever will be, is coming. When Jesus as the Savior has offered to us salvation, that if we would receive him as our Lord and Savior, we would be saved from wrath to come. And we'd be taken to heaven to be with the Lord forever. To receive our reward, to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Encourage us, Lord, that there is no wrath in store for us. Jesus took it all. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.